وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم. The Ascended Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al -Asi. Ten volumes of this multi-volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims, but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known, and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time, this book, Power Manifestations of the Sirah, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30 including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us, 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. My guest today is Imam Muhammad Al-Asi, who is the Mufassir of the Noble Quran, titled The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Ten volumes of this tafsir have already been published. Two more volumes are ready to go to press. Each volume is available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. And you can obtain these copies from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, G-O-R-M-L-E-Y, Ontario, L0H1G0. Brother Muhammad, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, in our last episode, uh, we ended at a point uh, where you were uh, explaining um, why some people are uh, suffering abject poverty and what are the reasons and causes for that. Uh, when we look at the world, um, people with power and wealth uh, do not uh, wish to uh, share that with others or give that, those powers up. So how are we to overcome uh, this dilemma? Well, you know, uh, these people who have power and wealth, they have it because the social fabric of those who don't have it is weak. In... In Quranic history, an example is given of two individuals, one of them having power, the other one having wealth. In the case of the person who is having power, and of course when you have power, you have also wealth with it. And when you have wealth, you also have power with it. But one is preponderant vis-a-vis -vis the other. So in this example, the preponderance of power over wealth was exemplified by the pharaoh in Egypt. إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعَا يَسْتَضَعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِنْهُمْ يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحِي نِسَاءَهُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ So the reason this ayah is telling us, I'm not going to translate it, but I'm just going to give you the meaning. What it's telling us is that the Pharaoh gets away with the abuse of power because of the weak social structure that he rules after. In other words, people don't have um, the, um, the force that comes with uh, the unity and the, um, the consolidation of society. Um, so his policy was to divide people. Inna Firauna ala fil ardi wa jala ahlaha shia. He 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 turned the occupants of the land that he ruled over into factions. 
he factionalized society. And the reason Muslims are having a very hard time in challenging the representation of power, power structures, power establishments, power hierarchies. The reason Muslims are having the problem in undoing the abuse, the concentration of power, the abuse of power, which means wars and bloodshed and instability in societies, is because their social fabric is fragmented. That's the way these people in power, that's the way they get away with doing what they are doing. The same thing can be said about those who have wealth. The people who have wealth, though, and, and there's a, a dynamic between people who have wealth and people who have power. We said the first, uh, the people who have power, an example of that was the pharaoh. People who had wealth, the example of that was Qarun. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with Qarun after he flaunted his wealth. He was showing off, you know, and it, people who have wealth have egos. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, we, we can't, there are always exceptions to these rules. That, you know, but what we're speaking about here is uh, the overall picture. So in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended uh, the life of Qarun by having the earth swallow him and his possessions. It's like the earth opened up and down went him and all that he had. So it is either the Muslims, if they can get their act together, the committed Muslims, if they can get their act together, understand what has to be done, consolidate their base and their society. At that time, people who are abusing power will no, will no longer be able to abuse that power. But as long as there's division, fragmentation, factionalism, and, you know, silly antagonism that polarizes people for no reason at all, these people are in power. And right now, they, they finesse this. People are in power. They finesse their act because... Now the way they divide societies is by penetrating the human mind. They brainwash people to be divided. And people think when they are divided, they are, they are, uh, they are separating themselves from each other on different bases. It could be racial bases. It could be class bases. It could be gender bases. It could be anything. But when they do that, they are convinced that what they are doing is right. And this is how powerful those who are in power, their power, before it, it's a, a, a military and a materialistic power, before it's that, it is a psychological and a social power that impacts the societies that they rule over. So how should Muslims deal with this challenge? By unity. It's simple. Division is the enemy. Unity is the solution. It's all it takes. I, when I was speaking about division, I thought it would be very simple to understand that, well, the solution to this is the absence of division. So Muslims have to work on the absence of division. But why can't they achieve unity? Because of their ignorance. Mo I'm sorry to say it hurts, actually, to say this. But Muslims are ignorant. They don't have enough information. They don't have accurate information. They don't have functional information. What they have is some tradition, some culture, some customs. They mix all of that together and they say, this is Islam. That's not Islam. Traditions and customs and cultures are not Islam. So they have to return to the source of Islam. The source of Islam are Allah's words and Allah's prophets. They return to that and then they reformulate their lives accordingly. So we know unity is important, but why can't Muslims achieve it? Because of their ignorance. 
Mu I'm sorry to say it hurts, actually, to say this, but Muslims are ignorant. They don't have enough information. They don't have accurate information. They don't have functional information. What they have is some tradition, some culture, some customs. They mix all of that together and they say, this is Islam. That's not Islam. Traditions and customs and cultures are not Islam. So they have to return to the source of Islam. The source of Islam are Allah's words and Allah's prophets. They return to that and then they reformulate their lives accordingly. Would it be fair to say that most people, including uh, many Muslims, uh, are guilty of indulging in shirk? Well, you know, when you say something like that, especially to those who are not very well versed in what it means to say something like that. When you say something like that, you open up a can of worms because it's not the way, it, it may be, it may be, most, mus most Muslims are tainted with shirk. That may be the case. I'm not going to argue against that. But to approach the problem is not to come and say, you're a mushrik, and, and then you turn literal and literalist in this instance, and you say, the, punish, the penalty and the punishment of a mushrik is that he should be killed. And this is what's going on in today's world. We have a takfiri and a tashriki uh, phenomenon, some Muslims going around saying all other Muslims are mushriks and kafirs, and then they begin these wars that we have, as you can look at Iraq and Syria, look at other places, look at uh, uh, Pakistan, look at some places in Africa, some places in... Muslims are, you know, approaching uh, the problems that they have with misinformation and with lack of information and they are uh, trapped in their own ignorance. The way out of the predicament that the Muslims is in, are in, the predicaments that the Muslims are in, the way out of that is to recapture the information that is accessible to them, that, come, that the information comes from Allah and His Prophet. Recapture that information, and then you, because look, when the Prophet came to his society, he didn't say to, oh, mushriks. He didn't look at the people and say, you're kafirs and you're mushriks. That wasn't the way he addressed them. They could have been. They were mushriks and kafirs. But he didn't tell them. He said, ya qawmi. All prophets did this. And this is the way you can't... If a person is... Um, I want to try to reduce this to a much more understandable level. If a person is a criminal, in the sense that he, ha he or she has criminal tendencies, you don't come to that person and say, even if the person was locked up in prison and released from prison, you don't come and say to that person, you're a criminal. What is that going to serve? What is that going to do? What, do you, what result do you expect out of that? If you're trying to adjust the person, if you're trying to uh, improve his or her condition, that's not the way to speak to them. But if the person is coming to you with a crime, he wants to rob you, he wants to kill you, he's involved in the act of criminality, at that point you tell him, you're a criminal. You face him with the fact that that is functioning at the time. But if a person has, in his latent self, has the definition of a criminal, you don't say you're a criminal. And this is where Muslims got it, have it wrong right now. They're, they're, they're putting the cart before the horse. And they're going out there and saying Muslims are mushriks and Muslims are kafirs and so forth. And therefore they justify shedding innocent blood. 
I know we have discussed this before, but for the benefit of our viewers, once again, uh, could you please briefly explain uh, the meaning of the word shirk? Sh uh, we've been down this road before, and I'll, I'll do it again. Shirk is the institutionalization of kufr. Kufr is the theoretical and the abstract objection to Allah. You take issue with Allah with a philosophy, with an ideology, with a set of ideas, you're a kafir. When you institutionalize that, you become a mushrik. It's as simple as it gets. In Surah Al-Hujurat, ayat number 6, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu in ja'akum fasiqum binaba'in fatabayyanu an tusibu qawmam bijahalatin fatusbihu alama fa'altum nadimeen. Of course, a number of aspects are uh, addressed uh, in this uh, ayat. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the committed Muslims. But I want you to please explain the meaning of the word fisk. Yes, the, the, the general meaning of this ayah is if a unreliable person comes to you, this is the general meaning, I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of it. If an unreliable person comes to you with information about a per another person, about another group of people, about whatever, the, the A is instructing us to um, seek the evidence pertaining to what he is saying or she is saying. Because the result of that is you are going, you may uh, inflict harm on a people, whatever the, inf the unreliable information was pertaining to, out of ignorance. You'll inflict that harm on them out of ignorance because you, you, you took information from an unreliable person. And then after that, فَتُصْبِحُ عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ You're going to regret what you did. So, the, the key word here and the word فَاسِق and فَاسِقِينَ and فَاسِقُونَ and فَاسِق This word occurs sort of uh, routinely when you read the Qur'an, you'll encounter it in many ayat of the Qur'an. And the word fasaqa, for those who out there who have a knack for language, about 80 to 90 percent of the verbs in the Arabic language that begin with fa, the letter F, fa, indicate two things coming apart. Fataha, if you open the door, you say fataha. The door has moved away from the wall. That's fataha. Falaka. Fajr. Uh, in this case, fasaka. There's fasama, there's fasala, there's. So here we're talking about fasaka. Fasaka. If we wanted to translate that into English, it would be something like disintegrate. When, when, th when things come apart, it, it, when they disintegrate from, from each other. So, fasaqa would mean disintegration. So, the, the way to, to, to put it in English is, if we, if we could do, if the English language permitted... The ayah is saying, if a disintegrated person, disintegrator, a disintegrating person, a disintegrated person comes to you with information. But what does disintegrate, disintegrated person means over here? It, the disintegration here means that what, is, what has happened in his character, in his personality, uh, the, um, the integrity of his morality has come, come apart. So 
He's no longer a person that can honor his word, that can keep his word, uh, and, um, and be truthful to what he is saying. He no, he no longer has that. And as, as I've mentioned, and I'll mention again, many words in the Qur'an are uh, fine-tuned in regards to the context that they are in. So in another ayah, for example, when the children of Israel, when they failed to obey Musa, alayhi salam, Musa said, فَافْرُقْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ This, he's addressing uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Part ways between us, meaning himself and his brother, and a people who are fasiqs, who are fasiqeen, which means they, they could not hold on their character could not hold with the order that came to them from Allah via Musa, which is make a military effort. Make a military effort and go into the Holy Land. So we're not doing it. So the, there was a disintegration in their character that was supposed to have been binded with Allah and His Prophet. So he said, Fafro. So in this, so that's, that, that's a clarification of the word fasiqin as it occurs in another ayah. But still the linguistic component of the meaning holds true in a, any of the ayat in the Qur'an. So if a person, a fasiq in this case, if a person whose moral and character integrity has disintegrated, if that type of person comes to you with a news item or with some information pertaining to a people, then you have to verify, verify, fatabayanu, lest you inflict harm on a, a community or a society out of ignorance because you have no evidence of what he said. And then the result of all of that is Regret. Was there, was there any uh, particular episode in early Islamic history um, that this particular uh, ayat uh, relates to? If there was, it doesn't come to my mind. It's a general rule that applies then, there, and in all times, in all places. I'm sure it, I'm sure there were people like that in the uh, prophet's time who would, you know, carry uh, unsubstantiated information would go around. And, and this guidance came for these types of people. It doesn't matter. You see, this is one of the problems Muslims have. They, instead of taking the Qur'an fresh as it is and looking, using its meaning in the real world, they want to go back and say, who did this apply to? And then they fall in another trap because they say, oh, that person later on, when the Prophet passed away, he participated in one of the battles, and what, 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 depending on what side in that battle he participated in, then that battle is going, because there, uh, there's two sides. In, in Islamic history, there were battles among Muslims, there was civil war among Muslims. And there were people who were lived in the time of the Prophet, who were of the Prophet's companions, who were either on this side of the battle or on that side of the battle. Ag enemies against each other. So if this ayah pertained to a person who happened to be in, one, in, in the battle on one side, then depending on which side you are on, you are going to judge the ayah according to Muslim history. And you're not going to judge Muslim history according to the ayah. This is a problem we have. We can't dwell in this psychology. We have to overcome it. 
or else we're just going to go in circles. We're going to remain like this for the coming, I don't know how many hundred years. Brother Muhammad, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, this has been uh, most enlightening, and we hope that uh, we can have uh, your insights uh, in the future as well. You've been watching uh, my uh, discussion with uh, Imam Muhammad al-Asi, who is the Mufassir of the Noble Quran titled uh, The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Ten volumes of this tafsir have already been published. Two more volumes are ready to go to press. Each volume is available at a special price of $30 from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, that is G-O-R-M-L-E-Y, Ontario, L-0-H-1-G-0. You've been watching Muslim Perspectives on Vision TV that is broadcast every Saturday from 2 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again on another episode uh, of Muslim Perspectives. Thank you for watching. I'm Zafar Bangash. For me and my team, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture, the first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al -Asi. Ten volumes of this multi-volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims, but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known and that is the treaties he entered into, as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time, this book, Power Manifestations of the Sira, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us, 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.